Hi, welcome to the Jenkins Cloud Native SIG. This morning we had an excellent um, meetup and demo and, and a discussion on the Tecton Client plugin by Vivav and Gareth. So that was really amazing. That will be online likely very soon, if not already, um, on the Jenkins YouTube channels. And this can just be a follow-up discussion as well as a discussion of some things that were mentioned in that meetup like Mink, which I have many more questions on. <laughs> and, and by all means, please ask any questions you have about any of any, any cloud native Jenkins um, topics, but especially anything that we've been discussing recently in the SIG, like around cloud events or the Tecton client plugin. I'm so, actually just looking yeah, at Mink right now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you asked like how we could probably use this. Um, it seems like it's a controller of its own. So okay. I'll, I'll just uh, share the link with you guys. Great, thank you. I don't know. I don't know how it could be used exactly because I like what the only thing I know about it is what James Stratton told, which was. Um, Mink was able to build multiple images in parallel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. The quite... Yeah, I've, I mean, I've, I've not, it's something that I wasn't really aware of until James mentioned it this morning. Um, so uh, yeah. It's just interesting because they, they're quite ambitious in their on the repo, they said the goal of Mink is to form a complete foundation for modern application development, which is simple to install and to get started with. That would be fantastic. And I'm just wondering how how that so complete foundation for modern application development. So is that the do are they do they mean the entire application lifecycle? Yeah. And then would it be something? Yeah. Would it be something like? James was saying how it would be it would be interesting to have something at that level, and he was thinking cross-plane. And I'm just wondering how the, all these tools either play off each other or work together, or how would one compose them? Is it like a is it a wrapper for for Tecton? Is that the idea? Or a wrapper for you know for sort of Tecton and Knative? Yeah, it seems like it. Um, it's yeah, it seems like it uses Knative and Tecton. Uh, to do what it does, I'm still not sure. I mean, the, the Mink CLI looks it looks sort of very similar to um, to the um, TKN CLI in terms of what you can do with it. It's very cool. I'm sorry, kind of derailed already at the beginning of this discussion on um, on this. I just had I similarly I'd never heard of it before. Um, James Strecken mentioned it, although I looked at the link they put for the demo and actually I've got it bookmarked. And um, James Rollins is in there. I can see I can see his image on the like he's he's sitting there watching the presentation. So <laughs> interesting. We oh, could. Uh spend some time uh, looking at what Mink is and see how it like integrates with our stories with Tecton. Um, to do that. I think so, some, some like good demos would be really handy with that or like repos that you can clone to play with. Um, I, I, I was thinking about like doing one for, sort of like Helm file with like like that CI Jenkins.io repo that I have, but cut down so get rid of all the stuff that we don't need and just have, um, so avoid using a custom image, but just have like the bare bones kind of stuff that you would need to run um, Tecton and Jenkins together, I think would be really good, including the, the workload or, the, or the, the role binding. That would be nice. Um, but then even once that's there, but having some like, example projects that you could import. 
So like this is a you know a repo with a Jenkins file and a and some Tekton resources. That would be great. Um, but then like the more I suppose more advanced stuff, so stuff using the user's syntax, um, that would be really nice. And if we could like the user's syntax without having to have a JX installation would be quite cool because that's that's where I kind of fell over on it this morning. Um, but we should be able to do that. The user syntax doesn't that comes directly from Tekton. Is that correct? Am I right? Yeah. It comes it comes from Jenkins X. It's the, oh, okay. It's the um it's like another pipeline inside. It's the JX effective pipeline stuff that manipulates the pipeline when you when you when you enable it. Um and can read a pipeline from another place, which it does it kind of it would work out of the box on a Jenkins and Tekton sort of installation, but if you want to reuse the JX pipelines, you actually need a JX installation that's there because it assumes that all your service accounts are set up in the right way um, and that you have the right CRDs in the cluster so that it can get like the, the correct SEM connection and all that kind of stuff. So whilst there, it, it's just, it, it's really, it's just a, a way of controlling at the moment, it's a way of controlling sort of Jenkins X pipelines from Jenkins. Um, so it works really good with that. But if you wanted to use it in a non Jenkins X scenario, but I want to um, replicate what a pipeline library is doing or a shared pipeline library would be doing, um, that would be a really good example to have. Because um, it should work. Nice. I, I agree with your first point too, that and the importance of having sort of example, example, um, not quite tutorials, but example little demos for people to spin up themselves. Because I think anytime yeah. you're asking for people's engagement, it's nice to make it super easy for them to experience it and see it. Um, and then hopefully they can get more involved too. Yeah, we probably, uh, the other thing I was thinking is like a, almost like a quick 101 on how to debug when a Tekton pipeline doesn't start. Oh, I think there was a talk recently on debugging your Tekton pipelines. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I gave a talk on that, but um, uh, so it was Vincent and I who gave the talk. Uh, but it was about uh, a new feature in Tekton with which you'll be able to uh, stop an execution of a, pipe, uh, a task run, and you should be able to kind of hijack a container and then uh, do some things over there and figure out why stuff went wrong and then that's that's the kind of debug it was but i think the debug that you're talking about is the is is like more of the yaml kind of debug in a way yeah so um quite often you'll get a you might get a task run that's been created and for some reason, the pod can't be created from that. So you're, you're trying to mount a workspace or a shared volume or something, or there's a secret that's referred into there, but it, it so like at the moment, the feedback into Jenkins isn't brilliant. It's like, it's quite good, but quite often you just get a null pointer or you just get a, an exception that's thrown that says, I can't find this pod. Mm -hmm. What we're not doing is we're not displaying the status coming back from the task run that actually failed inside, you know, and then linking it through to the pipeline. So there's definitely some either improved logging that we do, or we just need a like a, a little 101 on like how would you how would how would we expect someone to go and debug this if they've never dealt with it before? Does it make sense to do some pre-checks like uh like parse the or uh, parse whatever pipeline run task run we are using and like extract all all the volumes that need to, uh, that are mentioned there, and then just query them once before uh, uh, calling the tecton. Uh, sorry, so creating the tecton resource could be like a step we do before actually creating, and at that point uh, it can fail before actually creating the tecton. A resource by saying uh, uh, this resource was mentioned in this task run, 
but it's not available on the cluster uh, aborting uh, execution. Yeah, so if it fails when the pipeline run is being created, then I kind of, because you get quite good validation at that point. Yeah. Um, no. That it's that it's working. So if the pipeline run fails to create, it's it's got one of those um or they like admission web hook type things yeah. that validates it and then mm -hmm. um checks it's all there. So you will get that feedback and you should get the status and the reason from this from the actual state fields back into mm -hmm. um back into the Jenkins console. Uh but does but, the web hook validation check like if the resource is present? Like if a secret is present? This is something I'm not sure. that might have to be implemented yeah. on the Tekton webhook side. Yeah. I'm not sure if it does that at that level. But I suppose it would need you need to know whether it has, if the secret exists and you have access, you have permission to read it. But I would. I think it would be like really nice feedback to be able to give that information. Would um, you or either of you <laughs> like to do a demo, a uh, walkthrough of how to debug this? Um, and not, not necessarily right now. I mean, like in a. Yeah. Like me. <laughs> so once we've, once, once we've worked out how to debug it, then <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's, uh, I mean, there's also I issues at the moment. That we have. Yeah, that would be cool. What was that? Should I add it to the hack MD that we have? Uh, I have it open here. Oh, yeah. No, please do. Yeah. Great. It's morning wave running for me. The other piece I noticed, I was I was running some of these pipelines the other night from my Airbnb with a very slow internet connection, and um, they were taking the first time you pull an image down, they were taking um, like more than sixty seconds. So even though the task run was kind of in pending state, the pod hadn't started by that point. And Jenkins was saying that it basically the pipeline has failed because it hasn't failed to start within a certain timeout, but that's not necessarily the case. It did eventually start and recover. So there's definitely some improvements we could do to the logging, like the, the way that we log on there. How would you um, how would you go about looking at improving that logging? Do you want to talk about I think, it? What would we? I I think at the moment what we're doing is we I don't I, actually I don't so I've only my test cases that I've been playing with have only really been around pipeline runs. Um, I haven't done any sort of task runs directly, so it may be a bit different. But if we're we spin off a, we get a pipeline run, and then we get the, we kind of get the UID from that that comes back with, and then we're looking for task runs that have been created by that. I think is the correct way where where the owner reference is set to the right thing, and then we loop through those and try to discover a pod for each of those, um, and then we kind of wait for it to start. Uh, and I, th I think we just need some, which I think is probably the right way to do it. Um, although it may be worth looking at the logic that the TKN client uses, because that actually seems to uh, follow it quite nicely. Like it, it pauses, waits for the next one to start. And even the way that it you know, prefixes the, the name of the kind of like the task run and the, I think it's on the container or it might be the task task in the pipeline or something before you, in the log output, so you can see exactly where things are coming from. Maybe we should use like a similar, like log format for that. I think that would be quite cool. Uh, 
Um, I mean, you could even like use different colors to prefix the um, each pod or each container, and that's that's how it, that's how TKN does it. Um, just to make it more obvious when it's kind of switch control from one to another. So that would be cool. I, I lost you uh, about the control switching part. Um, this is about switching control from Jenkins to Tekton. No, so you see, this is just, a, this is for the, um, so the way that we're streaming the logs to the console at the moment, to the Jenkins console at the moment, um, I think the logic isn't, it's not quite right. And there are certain instances where it thinks that a pod has not started or has failed because we're waiting for a pod to start rather than checking the status of the task run. Um, so there are instances where mm -hmm. we loop for 60 seconds when actually, when you look at the state of the pipeline run, it's already failed. It's that no task runs have been created for that point. So. I think it's just tweaking the, the kind of looping logic that we have there. Um, and then the other part of that was when we go about writing to the, the Jenkins log to prefix the log statements with the sort of same information that the, T the TKN client does, mm -hmm. um, because that's a really nice, like simple, um, you, you can see it's like, it's gone from this pod to this one, to this one, to this one, done. Yeah. Great, right, I don't need to think any more about that. Um, and they color code it so you can, you know, your eyes, right, that's a block yeah. together and that's very a block clean. together. Yeah, it is very, very, very clean. I think we could do something very similar to that. Um, yeah. I really like, uh, like how you've given like the tecton when there is a tecton log in Jenkins console. Oh. That that was I I put that in as a debug statement initially just because I couldn't I couldn't work out where the logs were coming from, <laughs> um, and I found it was really useful. I like yeah to, just to be able to see it. it. What would be nice is like once it shows Tekton, maybe something like uh, like you said how TKN CLI does it like it shows the container uh, not the yeah. container the step name and then the log itself. Yeah, is it a task and then the step name? Is that is that what it shows? It it shows it shows the step name. It uh, yeah, it just shows the step name in in a square bracket. Or oh, the but when you want to check the container, the container is named as step dash. I mean step name dash step. That's yeah. how the container is named. Um, yeah, right now we are using owner references directly. Like we are checking if there is an owner reference for uh, some pod and if it has the task and owner reference. And based on that, we are pulling, right? It's, yeah. We're not checking for status really right now. That needs to be improved. I'm going to create an it, issue for that. It would be really nice to get some like tests in there that cover like a multi pod pipeline. As well, because at the moment, I, the, the, all the ones that I have are just single pods. It's just like simple hello world stuff. It just mm -hmm. checks that it runs. Uh, I think I've got one for like a slightly delayed startup, but that's about it. But it'd be really good to have those kind of edge cases and more complex pipelines in there. Um, These like, tests so. would, would, wouldn't be uh, unit tests, right? They'll be E2E tests. They're kind of end-to-end -end tests, yeah. Although they, they do run as part of the J unit normal unit mm -hmm. test phase within Maven because it's it's using that um it's using the fabricate mock Kubernetes stuff to do it. I've noticed one thing that in the fabricate uh, objects that we sorry, the fabricate, I don't know if they have, yeah, the classes, they don't have all the uh, all the parameters given. Or a CR, like some of the newer parameters are like missing. Um, okay. So um, that's that's why creating that's why that was like one of the reasons also why we dropped the custom or uh, create custom task uh, yeah. that we had before because uh, and it seemed like it's a better choice to just do YAML at that point because 
the yaml is directly then passed to the stream to or yeah. this or to the controller at that point I'm assuming that that um, that, that fabricate test client or whatever is generated rather than handcrafted. Is that the case? Do you know? I'm not sure about that. The test client or the uh, main library as well. So I suppose both, really. Um, the main library with yeah that well i suppose there's the tecton there's the yeah tecton client sort of main library thing as well the crds especially um I'm not sure if they are i mean let me just i'm going to uh, check that see if we have something on that side I haven't checked to see if there's a, an update in the dependency version. Actually, there might well be one as well. Was, was there any like non Tecton client stuff that we were, wanted to talk about? <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. I think there's, there's been a lot of Tecton client today. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, um, everything, I guess my, my main update would be everything is going extremely well for GSOC and we will almost certainly have a, well, I don't even think I can say that. It's all going well. <laughs> there will be cloud native stuff happening. Announcements are Monday. Um, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> And I think that um, the cloud events, whatever we choose to do with cloud events integration with the Tecton client stuff, will be really cool as well. Yeah. Um, that could be very, that could be really interesting, like a pipeline, you know, triggering pipelines or um, just just even getting notification that multiple stuff has run, um, like a deployment or whatever is taking place. There's, yeah, in the Tecton logs, you get all of the cloud event stuff in there already. So you can see it, it, it wants to log, it wants to send it somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where yet. Do you think that, am I, okay. Do you think that um, it will just be a matter of installing both plugins and we'll set them up to work together or will this evolve into something that naturally you would, you would use them all together so we would make them one? I'm just curious. I think I think you'd probably keep them. They'd probably be separate okay. plugins. Um, yeah. I, I suppose in terms of how it works. Uh, yeah. Because cloud events, you make one and not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 I I think the difficulty with cloud events is going to be when like when you've got like two things you want to integrate. That's really straightforward. Um, but then as soon as you start having more than two and are you configuring things on like a point-to-point -point communication channel rather than like i want to like have something that you can broadcast events to and then multiple things get those feeds um that may be one of the, i know we used um it's not really it's not cloud events but it's the same similar sort of thing in sdm for using segment as a method of um, doing that. But what actually happens is it, it it has this like reliable webhook delivery, but only if the first receiver or only if a one of the many receivers um, has a successful sort of um, receiver message. So if like one one passes and the other four or five fail, you, you, you never get a retry on those others. Um, so it's and it's a bit like you'd have to and i understand why it's quite a difficult thing to do like you know if you've got like 10 or 20 or 30 different endpoints that you're trying to relay to remembering which ones have accepted which messages and which ones you need to store up for who and like have like different retry lists basically um 
it's at scale it's it can be it could be a lot of data this is, this is a very uh, this problem is going to be the main problem in solving when it comes to cloud events because like like the initial stuff is pretty easy like if you want to implement the http request stuff like in through which cloud events are going to go through that's that stuff is easy but how it will work with like you know scalable infrastructure that's going to be a lot of setting up stuff and trying out a lot of different things yeah what has um if either of you know what has the cloud events sig in the cncf have they been i would imagine they're thinking about this problem and do they have any forming best practices or particular they thing? have okay i think you know this <laughs> uh, but uh, they do have a uh, best practices sig uh, i haven't joined it but it will be i think it's high time probably should join uh, at least one of us i did join the events sig last week or was it this week Oh, I meant, um, I didn't mean that, I probably said that wrong. I didn't mean the CDF, I meant the CNCFs, but yes. The... Oh, I, I have no idea. I haven't, um, you know. Yeah. 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 I owe oh, too many meetings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just sweating thinking about another meeting. Um, yeah, but uh, it makes sense to think about uh, like the best practices around them and see like how people are already doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's probably something we'll have to look into better. But uh, I, uh, so I had joined, so you were also there, uh, Kara, uh, I had joined the uh, event sick for CDF. And the there's this work on building a mini prototype for how cloud events will work. And I think I have a feeling uh, slowly the prototype uh, might, as the discussion around the prototype begins, there might be also discussion around how this could be scaled. And the discussion kind of already had started when uh, four keys was being discussed because like how, how can we manage so many uh, requests at one time and it was probably easy to do it through BigQuery uh, but it might not be as easy to Im implement something uh, that can do something similar on a smaller scale um, but yeah it's 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 going to, going to be a, a pro like something to think about in in the next few weeks what um what are your best resources for considering this problem like are there any go-to learning resources that you prefer for cloud events for well for cloud events but understanding this larger problem of having so you have a like a data driven like an event driven system and then and how do you handle that as it scales like how do you handle all the where you're showing your events how you're ensuring that Everybody who's subscribed, are you ensuring it? Do you just do retries? Like where where are you putting the responsibilities for that? Like do you have do you have resources on who who is working in that area or what books are good, things like that? <laughs> I actually haven't worked with events that much. Yeah. Um, I've only like worked with worked with them like on a very prototype level, like and that too just with cloud events. But I would uh, uh, with this prototype that we are doing for events, I'm hoping to learn more. Yeah. By doing that, I'm hoping that you know I get more uh, used to eventing uh, architecture itself. So I'm looking forward to the weekend as well, so I can just put up a neat POC. So. Nice. But what about you? Like when it comes to event eventing architecture and stuff, like. How do, how do you like, you know, get things in perspective because it, it can be overwhelming to think about like, you know, streams and stream processing and how everything will work together. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, 
the place that, or the individual I go to to try and understand more is um, my go to for that is the work of uh, Martin Flatman because yeah he just explains things very well but it, even with that it's it's so broad and there's so many possibilities that yeah <laughs> it's it's um it is really it's really hard determining like what would be the best practices for a given scenario or can we say generalized best practices and it feels like a very quickly evolving space um which is exciting and then it it also feels nice that way because you're realizing that a lot of people are still trying to figure this out so <laughs> you know there's that sense of being like okay we all are kind of uh, working together to try and find out what would, what would um, actually in practice be most scalable, most reliable, things like that. There's also like the scalability like, aspect of it all, isn't there, where you like initially, if you start something, start a new project with this kind of stuff, there's uh, loads of different ways you can do the same type. You know, if your data set is relatively small, it doesn't really matter. Like optimizations are, well, it's, it's not gonna make, any difference or like it like you might save a second or so but as soon as your data sets start to get bigger it becomes like really difficult like like you when you can't process it on a single machine um it's like it's a problem like like even just like the jenkins open source statistics like yeah. like you can't process it on a, on a like a brand new macbook pro it's too much data mm -hmm. right so um, you, ha you have to treat like how you handle the data and how you process it in a different way. And that's when it all becomes important. Um, and I guess something like, uh, not that we're using it for that, but BigQuery would be really great for browsers to launch. Much, much yeah, it, it, it's re it is really good for that kind of stuff. It can be very expensive if, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They have, they have a like quite a nice, um charging model where like, you can go and you know, you know in my school you can go and have a look at like i can go and do an explain on a query and and see if it's correctly using the right indexes and stuff but generally it doesn't really matter but you do the same in BigQuery; it tells you exactly how much these queries cost each time you run them and it's like i could tweak it slightly and i could save myself pounds and pound, you know dollars each time that you run that query you know, just by reordering some of the criteria sometimes as well. Mm, are we talking about BigQuery? I lost you guys on which yeah. BigQuery? Yeah. It's, uh, that's what that's what four keys is based on, like the uh, demo that I've never used BigQuery itself, but uh, is it it's a data processing tool, right? And it is yeah. GCP. So yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, they, they're doing a nice job of that. So for keys is open source, but they're showing it on, you know, very GCP specific platforms and <laughs> tools. Yeah. Caching is just GCP. You can just like use BigQuery with the other stuff. It's already there. So uh, when we talk about like uh, cloud events integration with Tekton, uh, this I was initially thinking that uh, we could probably start with like a event listener thing, uh, and then uh, as the as the cloud events uh, plugin project goes forward, we could think of uh, how to integrate it. But I think a good place would be to start with you know being able to just uh, create an event listener in Tekton. Or uh, uh, when you had mentioned that, Gareth, in the uh, uh, what's next part, like were you st thinking of something similar? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was looking at the fact that because Tekton is kind of, it has these events inside it, you know, like internally anyway, um, it would be really nice to try and get them out of there. Um, like try and either send them to something uh, or I, I think yeah try to try to get them yeah get the get the events out into something that can process them would be like probably initial a good initial step um, it would be it'd be it would create quite an interesting like I suppose once the cloud events plugin for Jenkins is there um 
you've got quite an interesting, you know, circular thing going on where they could be, you know, jobs completing inside Tecton that could trigger other things. Um, you could trigger jobs in Jenkins that then trigger more jobs in Tecton and yeah. Yeah. I just I just keep getting uh, confused between if we should uh, use the webhook webhook handlers given by tech Jenkins or at like at what point should we be able to uh, tell tell the user to switch like use the one that you already got for your uh, Jenkins job which is there like they can trigger the, trigger it using that or like uh, use the one given by Tecton. Like when do we, probably probably it could be like a chain trigger Jenkins job, which then triggers Tecton. Uh, I, think, I think people may be interested in like different things as well. Because mm -hmm. um, one, I think there's a nice feature in the Helm chart for Jenkins, where you can create the, you can have like Jenkins as being private, but have a secondary ingress rule set up automatically for the webhook handler. So the, you know, you, you're running, you're running your cluster on a private network that you, that you have to have a VPN or something to get to it. Um, but the only thing that's publicly available is the webhook. Um, and that that's quite a nice, um, way of doing things for this kind of stuff. Um, I, and I can see people wanting to do that. Like, yes. Yeah. This is in the Jenkins Hub chart? Yeah. Yeah, there's a secondary ingress feature. Mm -hmm. um, we actually use it on, on the Jenkins Infra to do this, this exact thing where we hide hide clusters behind a VPN, um, but ex the only thing that is exposed is the um, the secondary ingress. Okay, I see. Um, and, you, and, and because you get like on Azure AWS, wherever, you get a different IP address, you can put firewall rules on to just allow that traffic through. Yeah, I think I found it. So. Yep, that looks like it. I mean, you you can't you can't even have the different ingress rules. Um, you could have different um, certificate authorities for each of them. Which might be the requirement. So. so uh, to clarify, this is the ingress used for the webhook. It? Yeah, it's turned off by default, but when you when you enable it, um, mm -hmm. it creates yeah, it creates a secondary ingress to route that through. Pretty cool. I've, I've never actually, I've always created one ingress with one. I've never actually thought of creating a secondary ingress with anything. Uh, but yeah, this obviously is possible. I've never actually done it. Um, this is I a think it's. So go on. Sorry, go on, Cara. No, mine was tangential. So continue on your current discussion. I, I, I was just going to say, like, as long as the like the annotations and labels and stuff are exposed as well on the ingresses, you can do a, loads of clever things with them as well. Like if you wanted to put this behind, like I suppose any kind of you know service mesh or something like that, you could do that. Um, I haven't played around with a lot of ingress. I I think I think it's time to be able to do it.
Okay. So go, go on, car. Okay, my my it's like my quite tangential question actually is, um, what do you have? What have you heard about, and what do you know about? What do you think about the secret store CSI driver? That's it's sort of. I think it's. I, I'm not sure it's actually in Kubernetes yet. It might still be under development, and um, so I don't really know very much about it. But I was super interested in that. So this is um, the way that Kubernetes stores its secrets internally. Okay. 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 I think. Yeah. External secrets or thing like I sorry I didn't get you. Oh, the what I... secret store CSI driver because they i don't know if they're extending then the functionality they are talking about it as if uh, it can help consume external secrets and i don't know if they're beginning to extend the functionality into something more like what godaddy's Kubernetes external secrets does or i i just it was different than i've heard it talked about before and i wondered what you knew about that and thought about it so the the external secret stuff is yeah. I think of that as a way of replicating secrets into Kubernetes. Right. So I want to take, I want to store them externally from Kubernetes and I want to get them in and, and use them. But once they're in Kubernetes, they're protected by standard Kubernetes RBAC. Yeah. Um, and, you know, role control and just it, it's, there is no real encryption. Maybe they are encrypted at the disk level, but there isn't really, it's, it's, you know, base 64 encoded stuff. Whereas the, I think the secret, the, the thing you were referring to, like the CSI driver thing is a way of actually like storing rather than storing them, like in that way, they store them in a, like maybe back them off into something like a um, KMS or a vault style solution and store those secrets in there which might yeah that might be an option yeah yeah because of the way they talk about it it sounded a lot like the secret store csi would be like the driver helps my understanding is that driver helps bring the secrets from outside an external secret store and sort of upsort them integrate integrate them with kubernetes yeah it looks like you can it allows you to mount them so it, it sounds like if you've got a like a you know some kind of kms system in there they'll appear as secrets but were so but only available when you mount them onto yeah. a pod um, okay. which is quite that's it is quite nice um the the bit that always kind of interests me about these is that how does it work is how how would this work in a cloud you know kubernetes provider so i'm guessing that gke would enable google secrets manager somehow as its back end store mm -hmm. um or maybe the kms stuff actually because that could be that could be another option because they have got like cloud kms um for that type of system Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> no, but I learned something new today. So because because for some time I was thinking like I uh, and now it like makes makes a lot of sense why we would set up uh, KMS, uh, G, uh, Google's KMS with uh, with this. I was thinking before like I have some secrets for like a thing I'm working on in. Uh, in GK, uh, like not on KMS, but like how would I, you know, use them on GK? This so, was a question one of my friends asked me. I was, I just had no idea what to do. So, so I do this quite, I do this quite a bit actually, um, mm -hmm. and I had to do it the other week when I, I, I broke my cluster and then had to recreate it with everything. Um, but I, I use Google Secrets Manager to put the secrets in and then deploy um, Kubernetes external secrets to, to configure it to replicate those secrets down. Um, and providing your 
you've you've got workload identity enabled and you have a um, a service account in there that has got permission to read a secret it just replicates down and so it appears as a kubernetes secret and each time you go in and it polls as well so each time you go in and, and update it through the ui um it it will replicate down into the cluster which is which is really nice and obviously, if it's mounted to a volume, it's going to get an update that the secret is updated. So it knows that it's changed. So you get all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're doing it with Jenkins, you can, there's a Kubernetes credentials provider plugin that will then take the secrets, the external secrets has created and replicate them into credentials within Jenkins which is really nice. So if you want to, that's what I do with my, my Docker token and those kind of things is that I get, store them in, store them in Google Secrets Manager, replicate them into Kubernetes yeah. secrets, and then they go into Jenkins that way. Um, which means that out of the config, like it doesn't, it's not in the GCAS config. I don't need SOPs. I don't need my, to have all my GPG stuff. It just kind of works. We use this with uh, OpenShift Sync plugin as well. Um, so the secrets are uh, synced as uh, Kubernetes credentials, and the, those credentials are used for like whatever is being done by Sync plugin or client plugins. But yeah, this is very neat. Would we have to use Kubernetes credential provider at some point for uh, Tekton plugins? I'm not sure. So credentials is something that I haven't really, I, I'm not sure the best way of getting them into a pipeline run. Because you, you don't really want to write them as parameters. Um, I mean, that would be the easiest thing would be just be to do that, but it's it's pretty insecure because they're just available in plain text then. Um, and they're probably not going to be masked in the UI, but you, yeah, we probably do need a, a method of, um, certainly if you're running, if you're running that create raw step task or whatever inside or with credentials block, that could be quite a cool use case for that. That'd be nice. Like how, how would you then, do you set up the credential or the secret in a way that can be passed down? I, I didn't get you, uh, what would be very cool? So like in Jenkins pipeline, you have um, you have this with credentials block that you can use um, where you can, you can basically load a credential um, if it's, a short-lived credential, you it will request a new, um, a new kind of version of that. A good example is the GitHub app thing. So you get a short-lived token, um, yeah. and then it's passed. It's available as as environment variables to whatever the steps are you run inside that block. Um, so we would want to have a bit of a story about how we how we would use with credentials, and then put the Tekton create raw inside. What that actually does. Um, yes, do we pick up? Do we know that we've loaded a secret, or how do we? How would we reference a um, a credential that we would need to pass to it? Mm -hmm. That would be nice. So, uh, in like months ago, uh, when I was just starting off with the plugin, I had created a story. I don't know what I was thinking, but I just wrote add support for Kubernetes credentials provider. I don't know if you've seen it. But I was thinking if we could, uh, you know, kind of help add some kind of help with the service account stuff. Or like there are certain pipelines mm -hmm. only certain people can execute. Thing in those terms, and that would kind of map back to Kubernetes. So I think, I think the Kubernetes credentials provider only it provides like it takes from Kubernetes and imports it into Jenkins. 
I don't think there's any way of like doing it the other way. So taking a credential from Jenkins and making it available in Kubernetes. Um, but that would that would certainly be a good kind of use case for that. I will I will have a bit of a search for those plugins to see if something exists. Yeah. Would you be able to update the issue uh, if you uh, if you end up doing the research? I just shared it with you. Yeah, I've got that on the chat. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I don't think I have anything else at the moment. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking it's been a it's been a good good chat today. Um, any other questions or topics to discuss for today? Okay, all right. Happy Friday. Have a very good weekend, y'all. Thank you very much. You too, guys. Cheers. Bye.